Hey, it's Warren Hewitt here. Hope you're doing marvellously well. I'm sitting with Alejandro. How are you, mate? How are you, mate? So he's been working with us now for like a couple of weeks. What we've been doing is showing him the ropes a little bit in the studio. He's also a really shredding keyboard player. Both Alex and Natalie are recording Connection Apprentices. And what I wanted to do, frankly, is show what it is like to actually do this properly. And one of the things that I think frustrates me is it's very easy for an apprentice, an assistant, and an intern to sort of be given every single crappy job in the world. That is, fortunately slash unfortunately, a big part of the job because, you know, if you're the lowest on the food chain, you're gonna get that and you should be available and open to do those kind of things. However, to really get the most out of an apprenticeship, you need to be mentored. And mentoring can take lots of forms. Part of it is actually just being in a room and seeing how people relate to each other, how they get performances out of artists, how they get you know, the best out of every situation. That's a huge part of what we do. But of course, there's also the technical as well. But this doesn't just go out to assistants and interns and apprentices. This goes out to mentors as well. If you're a mentor, get to know the people that you're working with. I'm going to take your hat off to him. Here he is, he's humbling himself. He's playing with a huge Latin pop artist and you're coming in and you're hustling and you're trying to find, yeah, build relationships. So let's go in and check out what we're doing with Lenny. We'll check out the, the miking. Um, we're going to talk about mic placement and this, we're just going to really demonstrate. It's, this is a double whammy because I think this is showing what it's like to be a mentor, what it's like to learn as an apprentice. And we'll talk a little bit about, you know, how to record an acoustic guitar. We have Lennart here, otherwise known as Lenny. Lenny. Okay, so those of you who've watched the videos we've done, and you may already have seen them, um, I have a couple of favorite places. This is actually my favorite place to make an acoustic guitar. So it's down here, and it's on this bottom part of the horn. I would say for a small diaphragm, that's absolutely perfect. We're using a very inexpensive Lewitt microphone here. I believe this is an LCT. That's a 340, so I suppose it's about 300, 400 bucks. But we also sometimes use it like the cheapest one, the 140, which is like 200 bucks. But anyway, um, it's a really inexpensive but small diaphragm condenser. But frankly, I like inexpensive small diaphragm condensers because they don't pick up a huge amount of bottom end, so I don't have to EQ out all of the boominess. So the idea is to point it away from the sound hole at the bottom horn here. I love it because it picks up all of this kind of like, you know, feel if like it, it just is very, very percussive. So yeah, if you do the finger style or whatever it is, it's really nice. Right, next most popular place to put this is between the 12th and 14th fret. This is pretty standard and I think perfect for when using a large diaphragm. So it's usually in this area, 12th to 14th fret, and depending on the guitar player, if you've got somebody who's pretty accomplished, then you can probably pretty much put it about here, in the middle, sort of about there, pointed there, a few inches back, like three, four inches back. That's absolutely fine. The thing is when you're dealing with younger players or dynamic players, whatever, you might get a large diaphragm mic and just kind of pull it back here a bit. But make sure it's not pointing at the sound hole. You're gonna get a lot of booming there. So if it's a large diaphragm. So what you would do is you'd walk in the room, hey Lenny, play some guitar. Just have him play some guitar, you know, just, just kind of get a feel. What's he doing? You know, this is how he plays. He's pretty stationary. Cool. Just say, oh cool, great, yeah. Just keep playing. And he just just say, don't mind me, just play. Because you want, you don't want this stand to be in the way. So you've got to work around your artist. You don't go move your foot. You don't tell him to do anything different. The idea is like that's how he's sitting. That's how he's relaxed. Now think about how you're going to mic it. Don't start making them move. Don't start telling them they're doing something wrong because it's not our job. Our job is to make them feel comfortable, not uncomfortable. So if that's how he's sitting and that's how he wants to be, great. If you have to get a different stand, you get a different stand. If you have to change your cable out, you change your cable out. You don't do anything to make your artist uncomfortable. And sometimes that means you might want to put the mic miles away, because some people get nervous with mics. If they start saying things like, oh, am I too close to the mic? Am I touching this? If I move this way, am I going to hit it? If they start saying stuff like that, use your brain. Just go, oh yeah, don't worry about it. You know what, it sounds good back here. Because now they're going to be comfortable again. It's not 
you know, all of this stuff is important. It's very important, but it's not as important as capturing a good performance. Lenny's playing some rhythm stuff here. I've got this pre I'm using, which is uh, a BAE 1028. To be honest, it's like the pre I use all the time. So let's just get some more gain on it. Now basically, with these kind of pre's, the 10 series, like the 1073s, the 1028s, you know, all the classic 1081s, this, is, this has always been my trick, is I drive, and everybody I know that I respect, you drive the mic pre, the gain here, you drive that as hard as you can, and then you wind the output down. The rule always used to be, in England, at least I was told by like the BBC engineers and all that stuff, was like, click it till it distorts, and then click it back one. So when it's audibly distorting, that's too much. But when you don't hear it distorting, it's still distorting. It's still on the edge. It's still saturating. It's still sounding thick and giving you that, that classic kind of, you know, frankly, neat sound. This also has an impedance switch on this. And when I switch to 300 ohms, there's a bit more oomph in the signal. Back to 1200. I like the 300. On this pre, we have Phantom here. So the Phantom here, the 48 volts, is driving the, the small diaphragm condenser. And then if we insert the EQ here, you can see we've got a high pass. That's off. I go to 45. It's not boomy at all because the mic position is great. But out of just pure, you know, who knows, maybe I'm going to go up to 70. Usually mains harm, you know, power harm and air conditioning is around about the 60 and below. 60 below. Yeah, that's kind of, that's usually the problem area. So the 70 on this particular mic pre is nice. I'd rather do any high passing going in and get it right there. Um, and then when you come to mix, it's pretty much close. I'm not going to do any top end boost. I could. I mean, we, on acoustics, you could do a couple of things. You could go to like 10K. And yeah. There's, there's a nice like... Two, three dBs of 10k. It's kind of nice for a little. There's always a bit of ugliness around about low mids, but I don't really hear it so much on this one. But some people like to do all kinds of things. I mean, here's 700. Ugly. Mid range. Yeah. Two. Three. I don't like that. I mean, it's, it's good. There's some nice areas there. I'm just going to take it off that tiny bit of top lift just because we can. Why not? A little bit of top lift. That's probably about a dB and a half. Drive my mic pretty hard. 70 high pass. Um, Phantom on, obviously. And that's pretty much our acoustic guitar sound. I've got two compressors going here. I've got a DBX-165 going to 1176. You can simulate this in your DAW. You can see I'm getting a little bit Occasional reduction on here. Drive a little harder. I hear a 160, a DBX VU, whether it be a 160, a 165, a 162, the stereo. I hear them quicker than I see that move, needle move. If you listen to it and you hear that uh, uh, where it's catching it, you hear that. The, these, these needles, at least in my, my opinion, the VUs tend to be a little unresponsive to a certain extent. It might signal one or two B, one to two dBs worth of gain reduction, but it's usually like three, four, five that you're hearing. It's just that they take a second. That's the, the thing about VUs is they're a little yeah. time lag, but it's kind of yeah, nice. Yeah. I like watching VUs dance around. They're yeah. very musical. So to me, this, this is a good setting. We've got it on three to one. So basically, you know how, you know how gain reduction works? You know what three to one means? Yes. So it means it takes 3 dB. 3 dB and it gets one out. Exactly. Yes. Simple as that. So I think up to about 10, 10 to 1 is where you start first start feeling it more of a limiting. Like a limiter, yeah. But for me, honestly, limiting is like, like limiting to me is, is like 20 to 1. So, so 20 to 1, now let's go down here and look at our 1176. So our 1176 here, I've set as a ratio here of 20 to 1. My release time is at its fastest. My attack is three quarters of the way towards the fastest. So it's catching peaks. So if he plays a little bit more. 
see that? Wow. See this? 160 up here is working all the time lightly. Just tapping it, three to one. What it's doing is always taming it, just taming it nicely. And this, every now and then, when he just smacks it, you'll see it go, whoa, like yeah. this. Fastest release. So it's like that. If that wasn't there, we'd be printing like, bloody 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 like this. But yeah. what this is doing is just catching it. This is my favorite compression combination. I've been do doing this forever. Everything I've ever recorded that I like is this chain. Now you can simulate it. However, if I could only have one thing, it would always be, personally speaking, an 1176. Um, the plug-in, the bong factory, cheapy one, whatever. I love the way 1176s sound. I think now for modern, the modern age, the Distressor is kind of the new 1176. But this is kind of the everything compressor. Yeah. But yeah, love the way they work. Now, the one thing to know about the differences between these two compressors, this top one, the DBX, is a bearable threshold compressor. So what that means is here's your gain coming in, you turn your threshold down to meet the gain. Bearable thre threshold, threshold moves up here. You bring the threshold down like here, you're gonna get more compression as it hits the gain. This 1176 is called a fixed threshold. So what that means is the threshold's here, the more you turn the gain up, the more compression you get. So it's not going to be compressing at all, not going to be compressing at all. Now it compresses, you keep turning up the signal. So the input here goes against a fixed threshold. So variable fresh threshold, DBX, fixed threshold there. I always personally have the meter on 1176 set to gain reduction. So the only thing I see is when I'm hearing gain reduction. Yeah. Yeah. That's me. Some people, some people like to put it on output and and see whether they're driving it hard. But that to me is why I've got, you know, I'm looking at my console or my DAW or my tape machine, whatever I'm going into. There's another VU or another meter there. I don't need to meter the output of this because I always, always use my 1176 at the end of the chain, personally. So you know, I don't need that. But I love seeing game reduction. For me, these these two are always in game reduction. So. 20 to 1 on the 1176 full limiting, about 2, 3 or 4 for acoustic guitars, basses and vocals, usually about 3. I personally use it on auto because to me the classic DBX 160 is an auto release, attack and release, but you could play around with the attack and release. For me, I use my 165 as though it was actually a 160. My output gain is another way I can control my signal going into my 1176 because of course this is packed directly from my 165 into my 1176, 1176 into Pro Tools in this respect or whatever the end of You can see it's a gentle amount of compression, um, but it sounds good. So yeah, that's recording acoustic guitar. Some people, you know, if you rather to record like a guitar mono or stereo. I would say 99.9% .9 of my life it's always mono. If I want width, I'll record the guitar twice. I will stereo mic when there's a very limited amount of instruments and I'm really going for a very, very organic feel. It's very rare I do that double miking, but I know a lot of guys I respect. Um, yeah, Shetty sure. Akers, one of the greatest engineers ever lived, he would, he would do one on the 12th, 14th, or down bolo, and then one on the back of the body, even in like Tom Petty albums. And then sometimes, you know, guys like Shelley would double mic and then blend. So it would actually come back mono because he maybe wanted two elements of the sound, like double miking a cab. But my bigger point is, is I think that stereo miking for pop purposes and rock and roll is probably not necessary. Not necessary. But when you want to have ambience and you want to create maybe an illusion around the vocal, it's worth doing. Thank you ever so much for watching. We're going to do a bunch of these. It gives us a, a better idea of what it's like to A, mentor and B, be mentored because I think that's a really important thing because a lot of guys and girls go to studios and they don't know what to expect. And I think that this is what I would want to expect. Anyway, as ever, please go to Produce Like a Pro, sign up for the email list. You can try out the 14-day free trial of the Academy. There's loads of people helping each other out in there. And uh, thank you ever so much for watching and have a marvelous time recording and mixing. Muchachos, si les gusta el video, no olviden comentar y regálenos un like. Gracias.